Okay, good morning everyone, or we're just afternoon. Um, thank you for coming to this uh, webinar today. Um, my name is Ruth Brennan and I've been working um, for the last uh, five years as a Masts Research Associate uh, at SAMS and I've also been a part-time PhD student there uh, since uh, 2009 and working there since 2008. Um, so what I, I'm going to talk to you about today are several different projects um, that have been kind of going on in parallel over that time, all of them based on the uh, small island of Barra in the Outer Hebrides, where there's been quite a bitter uh, and intense conflict there um, around the creation of two marine protected areas off the coast of Barra um, since 2000. Um, so what I'm going to do is give you a little bit of background uh, about that conflict uh, around these two marine protected areas. Um, and then quite early on I'll give you a brief overview of the uh, methodology I used to investigate that conflict uh, because for the last four years I've been working with uh, a visual artist based in Glasgow called Stephen Hurl. And what we realized quite early on when we collaborated was that in, our, in my social science practice and in his artistic practice, we had actually been using very similar socially engaged methodologies in parallel. Um, and last year, we actually articulated this as an art science uh, methodology, even though we had both been carrying out these methods and methodologies in parallel. Um, what I also hope to give you a sense of is uh, the kind of relationships that uh, people on Barra have with um, their marine environment and uh, how complex that is, uh, so a sense of the social ecological uh, rather than just the ecological or the social environment um, on Barra. Um, and uh, what I hope that this work shows is the importance of expressing these kinds of complex relationships uh, in ways that are not just uh, reflecting economic perspectives um, but uh, incorporate cultural perspectives as well. So. Uh, I'll be talking about three related uh, projects, three interrelated projects, which are quite difficult to, to, to separate apart. Uh, the research I've done on the actual uh, conflict on Barra, um, which I've been uh, looking at since 2009, uh, and two art science collaborations, uh, one of them called Connecting Coastal Communities and the other one called Sea Stories. Um, and the final part of the presentation, I'll be looking in more detail at the uh, analysis of the um, marine protected area conflict on Barra, which I carried out, um, and talking about a, a, a quite a, a radical um, community-led co-management process that's currently unfolding on the sand of Barra between um, Marine Scotland um, and uh, key members of the community on Barra. Um, so, just to locate ourselves, this is where I, I spent quite a lot of time uh, over the last uh, six years, um, and this gives you kind of a better idea of of, of where Barra is located, if you, if you don't know it that well, at the tip of uh, the Outer Hebrides, so on the periphery of the periphery. Um, and the, the map on the right um, will also give you a sense that Barra is not just one island, it's, it's a whole archipelago of islands. Um, and if you look at the, the bottom of the map on the right, you'll see a small island called Mingale. That's been uninhabited since the late 1900s. So one of the marine protected areas of, uh, that I'll mention briefly was created to the east of uh, Mingale. And if you look to the north, northeast of Barra, uh, you'll see the sound of Barra, um, which is uh, located between the islands of Ariske, Barra, and uh, also uh, South Uist, which, which isn't labelled on that map. Um, so to give you a little bit of background uh, about how the conflict may started and the policy context for it, um, in 2000, Scottish Natural Heritage proposed the creation of a marine special area of conservation, uh, which is a type of marine protected area under the European Habitats Directive. Um, for the sound of Barra. Um, now, what's important to uh, note about the, legis the policy legislation under the, uh, the European uh, Habitats Directive is that in the creation of these marine special areas of uh, conservation, um, the member states uh, or the nature conservation areas involved in, in, in proposing them 
are not allowed to take social and economic considerations into account. They are only allowed to take into account uh, the scientific case for proposing these marine special areas uh, of conservation. Um, and marine special areas of conservation under the Habitats Directive um, are a response to the uh, international, uh, the Biodiversity Convention. So the idea of the marine special areas of conservation is to create an mature 2000 network, um, a biodiverse uh, network of biodiversity uh, within uh, the European Union to protect specific uh, habitats and uh, species which are listed in an annex uh, to that directive. Um, so in 2000, when the Scottish Natural Heritage proposed a special area of conservation uh, for the Sound of Barra to protect seals um, and sandbanks and reefs, they were met with huge resistance from the local uh, community at the time. Um, and um, at the time, uh, one of the things that uh, the local Barra uh, community did was they challenged the science on which um, the Sound of Barra uh, marine special area of conservation was was based and the minister for the environment at the time um, agreed uh, that the science uh, in relation specifically to the seal population that was proposed um, as a species to be protected um, that more science needed to be carried out uh, to justify this so the proposal went into abeyance it wasn't um, uh, it wasn't deproposed or unproposed, it was kind of in this limbo state um, until further science was 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 carried out uh, in relation to uh, the sound of Barra and the species and features which would be uh, proposed for protection under a marine special area of conservation. In the meantime, in uh, 2009, uh, Scottish Natural Heritage uh, proposed a different site off the coast of Mingale, the island which I mentioned earlier, the uninhabited island, uh, for the protection of uh, cold water coral reefs, uh, which incidentally have been identified by um, SAM scientists, uh, I think it was the year beforehand. It was the only known uh, UK inshore example of the reef complex, uh, complex Lophelia pertusa. And Lophelia pertusa was one of the uh, species listed in the Habitats Directive um, as an important species in need of uh, uh, protection. Um, so when this was proposed for designation uh, by Scottish Natural Heritage in 2009, um, the whole conflict on Barra uh, with the local community flared up again. Um, not so much because of uh, the location of uh, the East Mingale Reef, because there are far less human activities which take place around uh, East Mingale than there are around the Sound of Barra. And there is uh, some trawling that takes place off East Mingale, but the fishermen don't trawl over the reefs. And they know that they have known for a long time that the reefs are there, and um, they, they, their, uh, their nets would be um, would be destroyed if, if they actually trawled over the reef. However, it was more part of the conflict at this stage was more a fear that the Sound of Barra uh, SAC uh, would come back onto the agenda. And in the Sound of Barra, there are a lot more activities going on. Uh, for example, you have the uh, airport, uh, the Tribor Airport there, you have a fish processing factory, you have a ferry which um, travels from uh, Barra to Eriske. Uh, it's a very important creel uh, fishing area, there are fish farms there. Um, and it's also important to note at this stage that uh, unlike some marine protected areas, a marine special area of conservation is not uh, about um, outlawing or banning human activities uh, from occurring in that marine special area of conservation. It's about ensuring that the conservation objectives can be achieved and are not compromised by the human activities which, which can still take place. So um, when I started to look at this conflict in 2009, what struck me, one of the things that struck me was the very, very polarized way in which it was being presented in the media and in the documentation that I was reading about it. On the one hand, um, it was being presented uh, that um, SNH uh, were not um, taking human considerations or people into account and on the other hand it was being presented uh, that the that people on Barra were anti-environment and um, so what I wanted to understand was to get beneath this very black and white and polarized picture and I wanted to try to understand from um, a social cultural and historical perspective what were the factors that were actually shaping 
um, people's responses. Um, the very responses on Barra, um, which was prompting them to, to, to object so much to the possible creation of these um, marine special areas of conservation. Um, so just to move forward a little bit uh, before I, I, I get into the um, kind of the details of the conflict, in 2011, um, the East Mingalay Marine, Marine Special Area of Conservation was uh, approved for designation by the Environment Minister. Um, and as the local community on Barra had feared, the standard Barra Marine Special Area of Conservation was reproposed on the basis of um, uh, new data. Um, which had been uh, uh, carried out by um, SNH in 2011, and it was finally approved uh, after a very, very long and complicated process by the Minister for the Environment um, and Climate Change. In and uh, I think it was actually the last marine special area of conservation to be approved in the whole of the Natura 2000 uh, network. Um, so if I Jump forward now to the art science methodology that I that I mentioned uh, at the start. This is a methodology that um, I articulated only last uh, last year. Um, and as I said earlier, um, the visual artist that I've worked with for the last four years, uh, Stephen Hurl, um, whose work is uh, very socially engaged, we realised that, that we were using a very similar methodology in terms of, of how we how we approached. Um, our, our research, our artistic and social science practices. Um, so what I'm going to do, uh, and the, the overlapping interest you both have, um, is trying to understand uh, and articulate and make visible um, the shifting nature of the relationships between people and place. Um, so as I kind of take you through the research uh, that I did on Barra in terms of the, the conflict and the other art science collaborations I was involved in, um, I'll identify the different stages of, of this methodology as we went through, um, as I go through it. Um, but one of the one of the kind of most important um, overlapping uh, areas um, in this methodology that I realised I had with this artist Stephen Hurl that I work with was our very kind of open approach to responding to context rather than going in. In my case, with a research design, which was preordained and. Uh, rather than going in with preconceived ideas of, of, about questions that I wanted to answer or that I thought would be good to find out, it's a much more um, open and, and listening response uh, at the outset and um, that's taken. Uh, so that's what happened in 2011 when I first went to live on Bar for a month and a half um, to actually listen uh, to people uh, talking to me about the uh, Marine SAC uh, conflict on Barrow, which at that stage was in um, in full flow, um, and what I was trying to do was uh, through listening was to identify uh, recurring themes that would come up in my conversations with people, not only about the conflict but also about life generally on Barrow. I really want to try and understand from listening to people the social, historical, cultural context there, um, and my idea was to build a research design from listening to people around something that was relevant to them, that was really kind of grounded in, in that research context. Um, and, um, and so I had, I had several, several ways of doing this that unfolded in uh, 2011 of um, engaging with people. What I found very useful was, was uh, carrying out what I call conversations in context rather than setting up formal interviews with people. Was, doing things with people like, for example, going out on fishing boats with fishermen uh, or playing music in a, a local music session and um, gathering cockles on the, on the Tribor, which, uh, which people do daily, um, which is the, one of the beaches on Barra, um, and also tapping into um, to, to, to different skills to access different uh, parts of the population, for example, um, through uh, a conversation with somebody from uh, the Heritage Centre, I ended up being invited to uh, give a workshop on how to weave St. Bridget's crosses, which was something I'd learned how to do in primary school, but um, which they have done in, uh, on Barra for years. And in that way, I was able to access and um, have not threatening conversations with people um, that I wouldn't, that maybe wouldn't otherwise uh, have spoken to me. Um, and after I stayed on Barra for that uh, month and a half, listening and uh, talking to people, 
um, there were a few common themes which came out of that that really uh, struck me, and one in particular which I wanted to explore further, uh, which was around uh, the meaning of conservation. What people, what I was hearing from what people on Barra uh, understood conservation to mean, and what people on Barra perceived the Scottish government and SNH's understanding of conservation seemed to be two very diametrically opposed. So, um, for example, the, the perception of the understanding of conservation from people on Barra um, that they perceived the Scottish government to have was one of hands off, keep out, draw a line around, and don't touch. Um, and if you think back to the maps I showed you at the beginning, which had a line kind of delineating the areas of the marine special areas of conservation, that was kind of reinforced by that um, kind of um, static, uh, very static and uh, one layered uh, map with a line around it. Whereas what I was hearing from my conversations with people on Barra is that they, their understanding of conservation is to live with, to use and develop wisely. It's much more hands-on understanding. <clears throat> much more reflective of um, the dynamic interaction in a, in a social ecological system, um, <clears throat> which is not to say that they always do um, use and develop widely, but this, this was kind of their understanding of conservation. What had also struck me during that time was the different ways um, people had of knowing uh, their and understanding their marine environment, particularly when I was out on boats with um, the fishermen. Um, I was uh, struck by the different ways that they had of knowing and understanding their, their marine environment, different kind of knowledges that were, were there. Um, and I was reminded of the different ways of knowing put forward by the um, famous the psychologist Carl Jung. And his idea was that there are four, at least four different ways of knowing within in his therapeutic approach, that there are four different ways of knowing within the human personality. Um, that we are all dominant in, uh, usually dominant in one way of knowing, which for most of us will be thinking or rational interpretation. Um, and his therapeutic approach for his clients was um, to develop ways of knowing in, um, in, in the three other areas of um, embodied knowing or sensing, uh, in uh, knowing through feeling or ascribing negative or positive evaluations to something, and the kind of the deeper knowing of intuition, which um, is uh, perceiving through the inner world of the unconscious, which works through symbol and metaphor. Um, so I was quite interested in thinking about conservation along these lines and wanting to explore um, people's understanding of conservation in Barra in a way which reflected not just kind of the thinking or the rational interpretation approach to it, to figuring it out, and just some of these um, different ways of knowing as well. Um, and to do this, I realized that I would have to go uh, beyond words um, and move into uh, images. Um, and what I did was I, uh, when I went back to Barra in um, 2012 for my second field work trip, uh, I had a research meeting, meeting which I called to identify research participants who wanted to work with me further. I gave uh, 12 people, digital cameras, and I asked them to take photographs of the Barra and Battersea that they would like their grandchildren to enjoy when they grow up. Now, Battersea is the island which is, is joined uh, to Barra by a causeway. And I also asked them to find an image or an object which represented their connection to the sea or their feelings about the sea. So I was trying to uh, identify, uh, kind of come at conservation in uh, kind of an oblique or a subtle way, uh, and uh, to get them to reflect on the underlying values which they held, but then to project themselves forward about 50 years, but to think about, well, what, what would they still like to be there um, when their grandchildren grow up? Um, and it was, it was very, very open in that they could either take photographs with the digital cameras, um, or they could um, find photographs they already had, and then I conducted in-depth interviews with them um, of one or two hours discussing those photographs. Um, and this is an example, just coming back to the methodology of the, the, the second stage, the interactive approach, um, inter uh, interactively working with, uh, with the, the research participants, so they are shaping um, the research as, as, as much as the, the researcher. Um, and in uh, stage three of the, the methodology, which looks at collaborative feedback, is uh, actively working with those uh, 
making materials to the research participants, but actively um, uh, allowing them to shape those further in terms of their comments, which is which is what happened with um, a publication that I eventually produced from the photographs and discussions that I that I had, that I had, had with people. Um, they gave me permission to use their photographs, put them in a short publication um, with some text from their interviews underneath them. Um, and um, some people, uh, in, in relation to one particular research, but isn't the, the, the words that I had chosen uh, under the photograph that he had given to me, he asked me to put a, a different section from the interview under that. Um, so I'm, uh, I put them together in a, in a short publication, um, but I'm going to show you them now as, as part of the slideshow. Um, so the images that you see are the images that people have taken. Um, or given to me, and the text are their words, which are used with their permission. Um, and I divided them into, you see there are four or five different themes that come up um, when I'm showing you these images. And these are themes um, which I drew from um, the general context of the interviews uh, when I was, when I was um, putting the publication together. Um, so this uh, kind of photo essay uh, takes about four minutes.
Sorry, I'm just going to turn the music there. Oh, but maybe that means you can't hear me. <laughs> Okay, so um, that, uh, just coming back to the art science methodology, um, that's an example of the, the fourth stage of uh, production, which is uh, putting the materials gathered into a specific form. Um, and during my work on, on Barra, there were several examples of this. One was that photo essay, which, which I just uh, showed you, and which was really kind of giving me a sense of the, the, how the social and the ecological is intertwined um, on Barra um, and the different uh, layers of meaning that are there depending on depending on the viewer, depending on who's viewing and who's responding to it. Um, so you looking at those images will have a certain uh, layer of meaning for someone on Barra looking at it will, 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 will understand um, it on a, on a completely different level. Um, and uh, the uh, the other uh, specific forms uh, that the research on uh, the parallel research that I was carrying out on Barra with um, artist Stephen Hurl ended up taking was um, an illustrated publication, which I'll talk about a little bit now, called Belonging to the Sea, um, and also an interactive online cultural map of the sea, um, which I'll talk about in a moment as well, called Sea Stories. Um, and what these were really about um, was um, revealing the re people's relationships with the marine environment, again, revealing different ways of knowing, um, uh, making visible a representation of the intangible cultural heritage that is actually uh, wrapped up in the marine environment, intertwined with uh, the ecological, um, but that is not necessarily visible to uh, an outsider and is not necessarily articulated to people who kind of understand um, and live um, that uh, social ecological reality. So coming back to 2011, when I was on um, Barra doing my fieldwork, I had been joined there by another social ecologist, Ian McKinnon, from the Isle of Skye, and he had been funded to carry out um, a cultural project by a cultural organization, Colum Killa, to um, look at not only the uh, conflict that was going on on Barra, um, uh, but also a another a conflict between a small island community and, uh, and um, a government in, a, in the small island of Aran Moor uh, in Ireland off the coast of Donegal. Um, and because of the work that I had been doing on Barra, um, Ian invited me to work with him on this project. Um, and um, at a very early stage, um, we um, had come up with the idea of trying to create a, a dynamic map of the sea to try and articulate some of these uh, social, ecological, and cultural relationships, this intangible cultural heritage that I'm talking about, the, 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 the stories um, that are related to the sea. It could be to do with uh, the names that are there, the names of uh, rocks and reefs. It could be to do with navigational information that's there to, that, have, uh, that has been handed down through the generations. Um, and we wanted to find a way of articulating this through a dynamic map uh, in contrast to the very static map um, that I showed you in the beginning which was detailing the uh, the marine special area of, of conservation, not as a way, not that one is wrong and one is right, not as a way of replacing it, but of amplifying the picture of creating, um, uh, trying to articulate the social ecological picture rather than just the ecological. Um, so uh, we, had, we had this idea of a dynamic map, but we didn't actually know what form it would take. We kind of got stuck um, at that point. And, uh, at this stage, I had been involved in an art science expedition a few months earlier with an organization called Cape Farewell, who bring artists and scientists together to explore ideas of sustainability in the context of climate change. Um, and that's where I had uh, started discussions with uh, the visual artist Stephen Hurl, and he had been commissioned to work on, uh, to do some work on Barra for Cape Farewell, and he was interested in collaborating with me since we have overlapping interests. So Stephen joined uh, Ian and I on Barra. Um, and um, that's when we started actually our first art science collaboration working on the Connecting Coastal uh, Communities project. Um, and uh, what we did was on Barra and on Aaron Moore, um, Ian and I used uh, admiralty charts, which a lot of fishermen are familiar um, with uh, working with. 
uh, and we just ask them to talk to us about the area because they will all fish in um, very specific areas off their coast, not necessarily the whole coast, um, to talk to us about uh, the names of, of different features around there and the stories associated with them. Um, and uh, Stephen Hurl, the artist, put together a short uh, video of our, kind of our research process. It's about a minute and a half. Uh, which I'll show to you now because it will give you much more of a flavour of the kind of uh, work that we carried out in this initial stage uh, of the project of working with the fishermen to get an idea of this intangible cultural heritage um, that, uh, that exists in the seas around uh, both uh, Barra and Aran Moor. So I'll play that now. Um, so what came out of that um, Colin Killer funded project was an illustrated publication which is available as a, as a PDF online and um, with very few, few hard copies left uh, of it, um, which is in three languages. It's uh, called Lucas Namara, Lucas Namara belonging to the sea in um, Irish Gaelic, Scottish Lang Gaelic and in English. Um, which uh, gives a sense of this intangible cultural heritage that's there, but also looked um, at the respective conflicts on Barra uh, and uh, Aaron Moore um, from a, uh, a cultural point of view, rather than trying to decide um, uh, a right uh, or a wrong uh, about what the outcomes of the, of the conflict uh, should be. Um, and Building on that project and coming back to the dynamic map of the sea idea on uh, one of the uh, creel boat fishing trips where, where I was out with one of the fishermen on Barra, um, the artist Stephen Hurl joined me and he was uh, inspired by this screen which you, you saw in, in, in the video of um, where the uh, fishermen can document where they've, they, they've shot their creels and are building up a, a picture of the, the topography of the seabed. Um, so, uh, building on Ian's and my dynamic map of the sea idea, he came up with the idea of creating um, a digital map of the sea, um, an interactive map of the sea, um, and um, applied to Creative Scotland uh, for funding for this project, which, which we were granted in collaboration with Voluntary Action ba Barra and Vatersay, uh, one of the community companies on, uh, on Barra. Um, and what eventually came out of the um, uh, this project was a digital online map of the sea uh, called Sea Stories, which was based on the work we had been doing in uh, connecting coastal communities. We used the stories and the names that we had collected there to uh, animate um, uh, the map initially, um, and, and we presented a prototype format quite early on to, to the board members of Voluntary Action uh, Barra and Battersea for their for their feedback for their feedback, and that was completely handed over to Sheer Media. Um, the, 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 to the control of Sheer Media, the media company on, on Barra in November 2013. Um, so this gives you an example of, of, of what the aesthetic of the map is. 
Um, so it's built on, on top of the Admiralty charts and we were working with a, a computer programmer um, and a uh, designer and we were also working with a public user interface a designer, a creative consultant um, and uh, we were uh, directing them as to the feel that the map uh, should have which is very much wanting things to emerge from within the ocean rather than to be imposed uh, on the map because one of the problems with the marine special areas of conservation was a feeling that these designations are being imposed on uh, the, the, the people of Barra. Um, so what I'll, uh, there, there are several different ways in which um, the stories are, um, were illustrated in our kind of initial um, version of the map and it's important also to note that this is something which is uh, being populated on an ongoing basis now by um, people on Barra. It's an intergenerational project which is um, uh, involves school children collecting stories, uh, forms part of their, their, their media class uh, in, in the school, fit, into the, fit quite well into the curriculum for excellence. Um, but one of the ways in which we illustrated um, or subcontracted to another artist to illustrate some of the stories there was using something called kinetic typography um, to illustrate some of the, uh, one of the, some of the stories uh, of the fishermen there. So I'm going to give you an example of a story that's called Rusty Lobsters where you have a fisherman in Barra explaining why the lobsters that he uh, and his friends catches around this particular wreck um, are called, called Rusty Lobsters. So there are several other stories illustrated with that uh, kinetic typography. Um, there was another story where Stephen had the idea of illustrating it in a comic book, st book style and subcontracted to another artist to do this because it had an adventure feel about it, which is how a particular reef of the east coast of Barra called Bochleric in Gaelic, or the Reef of the Priest, uh, got its name. So I'll just play you this now, and it's narrated by a fisherman and historian um, on Barra. Okay, so the the final part of the uh, the talk um, kind of comes back um, away from the the art science collaborations, but comes back to looking at the actual details of the marine special area of conservation conflict that I, I started talking about, and I mentioned a community led management process that's currently unfolding there. Um, so what I'd like to do is um, go through um, some of the, the turning points that, uh, that, that I identified uh, in my analysis of, of that conflict. Um, one of the things that I 
looked at in my analysis of the conflict was the idea of power as a network. So rather than conceptualizing power as the idea of um, uh, the powerless and the powerful people having power, uh, having to transfer it to people who don't have power, um, is I looked at uh, a reconceptualization uh, by um, Hayward um, of uh, power as actually thinking about power as a field uh, of uh, a network of different relations uh, or social boundaries uh, between actors uh, that consist of both constraining action, actions and uh, enabling uh, actions and these are applying to what were previously have been categorized as powerful and uh, powerless actors. Um, so in terms of the Barra conflict, there was, uh, in the analysis I did, there was a dynamic there of, this, I say, a victim-oppressor uh, dynamic, which wasn't at all clear-cut, um, but, there, was, but there, was, uh, there were senses of the local community, or members of the local community, because the local community is by no means uh, something that is uh, heterogeneous, uh, or it is, but that is by no means homogenous, it is heterogeneous. Um, and members of the local community feeling victimized by um, what they would term as powers, powers that be within, uh, within government. Um, so the, um, the research that I carried out, however, argues that what Hayward identifies uh, one of the mechanisms as power of social, as, as social identities. However, in the research that I was doing on the social ecological system of Barra, and particularly in relation to the sound of Barra, that particular marine special area conservation, it argues that um, social identities need to be expanded to social ecologically, social ecological identities in order to fully understand what's going on um, in the conflict in the sound of Barra in relation um, and in particular to understand the, the co-management process that's unfolding there at the moment. Um, and um, since 2012 it looks like that this network, if we look at it as a network of social and ecological boundaries um, that are linking both the policy environment um, not only the Barra community, because there are the Ariske community and South Uist communities are involved as well um, in the Sound of Barra, and the other than human environment of the Sound of Barra, um, what it seems is these social and ecological boundaries are being reframed as enabling, whereas up to now they have been uh, framed and perceived and understood as uh, constraining, particularly by members of, of, of the Barra community. Um, and um, one of the things that, that, that I've seen happening is um, a redefinition of the key actors uh, in the conflict uh, in relation, their, their, their re they have been redefining their positions in relation um, to each other. And again, it was much easier to, uh, to see this when I was thinking of power as a network rather than as uh, groups of people who are so-called powerful and, and powerless. Um, and what has also become evident is that there have been um, very strong underlying social and cultural norms both within the community on Barra and within the marine policy environment um, which have been uh, quite radically transformed over the last couple of years which have created new fields of possibility which have created the possibility for this unfolding co-management process that, that, is, that is happening there at the moment. Um, and um, to use the words of one of my uh, research participants, um, what, uh, what seems to be happening uh, there is that um, the marine policy environment and people on bar are now going with the tide rather than uh, against the tide uh, in terms of the transformations that, uh, that I've seen uh, taking place. So um, if I just briefly run through um, some of the turning points which I've identified since 2012, some of the very significant events that have brought about this commander and process. The first one was um, a key meeting between the Environment Minister, who was Stuart Seedens at the time, with uh, members of uh, the Barra community travelled um, to Holyrood in, in February 2012 um, to discuss the Barra community taking the lead on management. Now remember, the sound of Barra wasn't actually designated until 2013, so at this point it wasn't yet clear whether the sound of Barra would be uh, actually designated a marine SSC or not, but the community expected that it would take place. Um, also, uh, with marine special areas of conservation, there is no obligation under the Habitats Directive to create a management plan for them, and most special areas of conservation apparently do not have a management plan. However, what was being discussed at this stage was the possibility of the community retaining some control if a designation happened in the form of controlling the management of the marine special areas of conservation. In March 2012, there was a a meeting uh, with fisheries representatives, representatives of uh, the local community, and included 
Marine Scotland, um, and uh, SNH was represented there as well. But one of the things that happened or that was agreed uh, after that meeting was that um, Marine Scotland would start to engage with the Sound of Barra communities uh, in Barra, Eriskay and South Eust in order to develop a management plan, again, should the Sound of Barra become um, designated. Um, and importantly, in, in July 2012, uh, this a specific Marine Scotland official was designated to initiate dialogue on Barra. So there was a very important movement here from um, key members of the Barra community who agreed to engage in that dialogue because up to then they had been very much pushing the policy environment away and not wanting to engage on the basis that they didn't need a designation for the marine environment and wanted and they could take care of it themselves. Um, so here they really kind of took uh, a step out of their kind of previous roles into uh, a different space in, 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 in starting uh, uh, to engage in dialogue with, with Marine Scotland. Um, and in November 2012, the Environment Minister, who at this stage was um, the newly appointed Paul Wheelhouse, uh, ordered an independent review of the scientific case uh, for um, the sound of Barra to make sure that the science was sound. Um, and in the meantime, uh, what was also happening was that um, the Marine Scot uh, Scotland official was uh, within the policy environment proposing a radically new approach uh, to Marine Scotland uh, colleagues, to SNH and to Nature 2000 policy advisors. Because he, was, he had sent a draft management plan to uh, the community on Barra in November 2012, which wasn't well received. And at that stage, he had been engaged in dialogue enough to know um, that anything that was going to be coming and instigated by Marine Scotland or the policy environment going to be greeted with a lot of suspicion. Um, so this was quite a radical approach to be um, pioneered by someone within um, the, the policy environment to actually go genuinely bottom up and to engineer and to engineer a community-led approach to start from the bottom and to scrap the kind of the draft plan that they had um, already. And at the same time, um, because this dialogue had actually opened up on Barra, people within the Barra community that were engaging in this dialogue were having to sell to other members of the community um, that this was the right way forward for them. Um, and they were actually, uh, certain of them were being seen as betraying the cause as such within their community because up to then it had been very much um, a case of pushing the policy environment away. So there were kind of, um, on both sides there were key people within the policy environment, within the environment in Barra kind of pushing, um, stepping out uh, of their roles into, into a different arena to try and uh, create a different, a different dynamic. Um, and this, to come back to the power network relations, was kind of changing uh, the start of kind of changing these constraining dynamics into, into more enabling dynamics, but by no means uh, a, an easy or a conflict-free uh, process. Another key point was uh, Minister Wheelhouse personally visited Barra in 2013 with the Marine Scotland official um, and uh, met with whoever there wanted to talk to him. I think there were about um, 12 or 15 people at the meeting and quite a lot of fishermen there. Um, and even though uh, he hadn't taken the decision on the sound of Barra Marina, I see at this stage, he indicated that he had the results of the, the review of the science and there was nothing in that which could, um, uh, there was nothing in the review of the science which uh, would give him grounds not to designate the sound of Barra as a marine special area of conservation. So in one sense he was delivering quite unwelcome news, um, but it was interesting at how well uh, the actual meeting went. So again, there had been a change in rhetoric at this stage. There was there was something different happening in the process at this stage, um, and Marine Scotland specifically referred in this meeting to um, SNH and Marine Scotland going forward as being experts on tap rather than uh, on top, so the community would be in the lead. Now it's also interesting to note that there was a very supportive um, policy backdrop to these changes that were happening, um, that were uh, one of which was pointed out to me by uh, the Marine Scotland official. Uh, he referred to the um, a consistent message from um, Sir Peter Housden, uh, the permanent secretary, um, to uh, within Scottish government, which would be circulated within Scottish government, to take risks, uh, to do things differently. If doing things differently is going to achieve a better outcome, um, and uh, and a, a legislative kind of backdrop to these changes um, that was also relevant was the uh, Community Empowerment Scotland Bill at the time, which. Uh, which showed the Scottish Government's commitment to, in their words, describing a community being supported to do things for, for themselves. Um, so another um, 
important uh, point in this process was uh, in February 2014, um, the dialogue uh, with Marine Scotland on the management uh, process for the Sound of Barra, which at this stage had been designated, um, had got to the point where there were three options being uh, considered to actually come up with a, a suitable management structure. The question was, how are we going to come up with a suitable management structure for this marine special area of conservation? So the options were to, um, for Marine Scotland to fund an outside consultant uh, to, to, to advise on how to do it. Uh, another option um, was for uh, someone uh, who was already a Marine Scotland uh, representative to uh, stay on Barra for a year and to advise how to do it. And then the, the local, one of the local community companies, Voluntary Action Barra and Battersea, put forward a third option. They said, we'll do it. We will facilitate uh, discussions with the other two communities and come up with what we think the, the, the community-led management structure um, for Barra should be. And Marine Scotland agreed to fund them to do that, and they would produce reports and would be able to use the funding um, to draft in experts as expert advice as they uh, needed it. Um, and it's been a slow process, and uh, the last update I got was in uh, March 2015, where Voluntary Action had sent a management structure report to Marine Scotland highlighting the issues um, to, to be addressed to allow management to be carried out through the eyes of local people. And um, going forward, um, from my understanding, the intention is for Marine Scotland to fund further work by uh, voluntary action uh, in order to determine what the management group structure uh, should be. So issues raised have, for example, included um, the representation of all three communities, what appointment criteria should be, should people be appointed, should they be elected onto this uh, management group structure, how importantly can uh, advice or expert advice be accessed without um, uh, local control being lost, um, there will be an outcome agreement which will be drafted which will ensure that statutory conservation objectives can be met because these have to be met um, alongside, um, uh, alongside the community-led and as part of the community-led management process um, and the management plan uh, the uh, plan is to develop and implement that um, in 2015, probably more like 2016. Um, so the hope is that the, the community around the Sand of Barra, uh, led by um, Barra um, and including Eriskane South Youth, uh, will take the next step for and with uh, Marine Scotland. So it's quite uh, a different picture that is now being presented um, to, to the very kind of polarized picture at the, at, at the start. Um, of the conflict in 2000 or even in 2009 when it, it flared up again. Um, so just finally to, to give a brief, uh, a few brief examples of the transformations in the, the social and cultural norms that I, that I mentioned earlier that I had seen happening um, with, during the time that I was studying this conflict. Um, most of these happened since 2012 from when I identified the turning points. But it's, I think it's really important to identify that, that a very, very early seed was planted by the, um, the SNH um, Scottish Natural Heritage official who was responsible for leading the Marine Special Area of Conservation process um, in Barra. And uh, up to 2008, um, when the Scottish Natural Heritage carried out their, um, were putting together their scientific case to present it to the minister, this was considered as ministerial advice. And until the minister had approved or not approved, scientific case, it wasn't allowed to be released to the public, which was causing huge issues around um, uh, allegations from the local community of the process not being transparent, uh, there was no way of proving to them that their, that their comments at the consultations which were carried out have been taken into account. It was making, um, it, it was in any event a very, very difficult process for SNH to apply when they were only allowed to take the scientific case account and have to present this at a consultation to a public meeting of, of very angry islanders. So in 2008, um, this particular SNH official persuaded the relevant people that the scientific case that should be released as public documents um, uh, well in advance of consultation processes before ministerial approval was given. So in the case of the Sound and Barra and East Mingley, respectively, this information was released three years and two years rather than the beforehand, rather than the usual kind of just before the 12-week consultation process. Um, the, uh, again, kind of overlapping with the identification of turning points, there was a definite transformation in a norm with the willingness of uh, people in Barra to engage in dialogue with uh, Marine Scotland. And also, um, in 2013, <coughs> there's a record of this, the Scottish Government, Minister Wheelhouse at the time, 
um, expressed a willingness to change the laws if necessary, which in this case would be the regulations uh, implementing the Habitats Directive, to allow a community-led co-management structure, which is currently not envisaged in the, the, the Habitats uh, regulations. Um, and uh, a huge uh, transformation in the norm was the actual appointment of uh, the local community company rather than an external expert as facilitator. And this shows several, several things. Coming back to the power analysis, it shows a repositioning of actors and knowledges within uh, the power field um, and it's, it's, it's redefining, actively, actively redefining the network of social and ecological boundaries um, that are on BARA. It particularly shows um, to local people that the policy environment is both valuing and respecting local ways of knowing and doing rather than um, imposing um, experts from, uh, from the outset. Um, and it is also uh, leading to new possibilities for action because we have the policy environment, uh, local people, um, and the non-human environment of the sound uh, of Barra, which the art science work shows uh, is clearly intertwined um, with uh, the people of Barra, um, co-producing knowledge uh, in a way that hasn't happened uh, before. Um, and another interesting example is that Marine, Marine Scotland has said, well, we may not be a, a member of the management group. We don't know if we're going to be invited to be a member of the management group. So they really are kind of sticking by their um, uh, their rhetoric of we're there to be on tap rather than on top. And uh, there really is uh, listening and dialogue and collaboration going going on there in, in, in quite a, a progressive and a radical way. Um, so just to, to finish, um, when I was um, writing up my analysis of this conflict, I came across a, a performance art piece called Coexisting by two young artists um, in, in America. And um, what they do is they, they balance on this very small plinth for eight hours uh, a day while, while the exhibition was on. And they constantly have to renegotiate their positions in, in relation to each other. There is no position in which they are fully comfortable. They're constantly having to move around, but also collaborate and work together so that they can both occupy this plinth. And it struck me as quite a good metaphor for the relationship between the policy environment um, and local people on, on, on Barra in this instance. I don't think it's ever uh, going to be uh, a, uh, a comfortable uh, completely consensual or conflict-free uh, relationship, there is always going to be a certain amount of manoeuvring, uh, again, if you think of the power field that, 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 that needs to be done. Um, and what I think, uh, just in conclusion, that the transformations in these norms that I've, I've outlined are doing is actually making relationships of local people, which up to now weren't necessarily visible outside of Bar, but they're making them legible within the policy environment um, and facilitating new possibilities um, for policymakers and community representatives to engage in open dialogue with each other. And it's importantly creating new space for different values, competing value systems, either worldviews and ways of knowing and doing, um, to become visible within the policy environment and, and to take a part in there. And uh, the quid pro quo of that is that the policy environment is now much more um, visible and being worked with actively within, within BARA. Um, and finally, what it's doing is really reflecting how nature and culture is uh, entangled, and it's acknowledging that different conceptualizations of nature and what nature is in social ecological systems can actually um, coexist um, and not necessarily always agree. Um, so I think, yeah, that was that was my last slide. Um, so if I if I come out of that now and go into um, my webinar control panel. Uh, I think this is the point at which uh, people can ask um, questions. Do you have any? I see we've got yeah, twelve people here, including me and John. So if anyone would like to ask a question, you can either raise a hand by clicking on the hand beside your name in the webinar control panel, or you can type a question and then I see it somewhere and I can answer. Oh. oh, I see I have some questions here that I've got, which I wasn't looking at early. Oh, I can see that someone couldn't hear the film at all. I'm very sorry about that. I had um, checked the um, sound yesterday. 
what so the question that I have here from Jean-Luc Solon is what pre-2012 uh, allowed people to go with the tide was it your social project or did better relations start because the government changed um, I think it was uh, a combination of uh, different things uh, I think there was definitely a uh, a contribution from the research that I was doing, but that it, it was a contributory factor. Um, but it by no means was um, the only factor. And the reason that I uh, know it was a contributory factor is, is that in one of the turning points I mentioned, a joint fisheries consultation committee, they specifically mentioned um, a consultation response um, that uh, I had written and uh, co-authored after my fieldwork. Uh, on the Sound of Barra uh, conflict, which was recommending letting the local community take uh, the lead and uh, bringing more of a social aspect into the process, and that was specifically referred to uh, at that meeting, uh, after which the dialogue with Marine Scotland started. Um, however, more importantly, um, and I don't necessarily think it was because just because government changed either, I think the important things here are that there were um, key people um, who in parallel, as I described earlier, started stepping out of their usual roles and stepping into quite vulnerable spaces and deciding to try something new. So on the part of the Marine Scotland official uh, wanting to try a genuinely bottom-up approach, on the part of the people in Barra who were engaged in that dialogue, really um, deciding to engage in that dialogue despite what other members, uh, some other members of the community, Barra community might think. Um, in in terms of kind of not holding their ground or betraying their their previous position, um, and then I have another question from Jean-Luc Solon, which is: MPAs are often threatened by outside actors, for example, nomadic trawlers. Is the new management paradigm taking into account the necessary control of these sorts of activities? that can be much more damaging and in scale and impact. Well, first of all, the new management paradigm is unfolding. The management plan hasn't yet even been drafted because the management structure hasn't been taken, uh, taken uh, management structure hasn't been determined yet. Um, so I think the question is, will the new management paradigm take into account the control of these activities? And I think the answer is yes, it has to because, uh, and it's very clear that the uh, management paradigm it has to meet the conservation objectives uh, that are there. So this has to be taken into account. Um, um, so it will involve as much the local people working with um, those conservation objectives and the obligations of the policy environment as it involves the policy environment um, working with the, the, the local knowledge of local people. Um, and then a question from Claire Scanlon. Do you think this process should be extended to all or most SAC MPA designation process uh, processes? Clearly there are benefits, but are there likely to be additional costs to the process? Further question, is the working of this model being evaluated by the SAC meeting its uh, conservation objectives, uh, or are there also other measures? Um, so the first question, do I think the process should be extended to all or most SAC MPA uh, designation processes. Um, I think uh, I think it depends on the actual SAC designation processes. Um, I think one of the one of the things that this research showed is that the local um, cultural and sociological, social ecological context that, that the importance of considering that in depth is, is very important in shaping what the process should be and going forward. So I'm hesitant to say that there is a one-size-fits-all solution that should be applied going forward because I don't think there is. I think general principles that can be applied going forward um, definitely can be drawn out from, from this process, which is um, uh, people willing to step away from previous positions, both in the policy environment and on a local level, and to engage in a repositioning, which opens up possibilities for new dialogue and, uh, and new ways forward. Um, are there likely, in relation to the question of, are there likely to be um, additional costs uh, to the process? Uh, again, that will depend on, um, on, what, on what the process is. 
Um, and is the working of this model being evaluated by the SAC meeting its conservation objectives, or uh, are there also um, other models? As far as I'm aware, um, the evaluation is around uh, the meeting of the conservation objectives, but my research on this um, cut off in March 2015, um, and that was at the stage when this actual structure, management structure, um, was uh, and is still being uh, negotiated and defined. Um, so uh, in relation to whether there are also uh, other measures, I don't know what the answer to this, that is at this point, um, or whether there is a, a plan for other measures to be put in place. Um, that would be a, a separate follow-on project. Um, are there any other questions that people have? Um, And also, it would be it would be good um, to know because I know Jean Luc said he couldn't hear the film. Could is, is there anyone else that couldn't hear the film, uh, or couldn't hear any of the audiovisual stuff that I was playing? Okay, so no one has said no. So I'm presuming that you were able to hear. Hey Ruth, I think we've got another comment from Claire. Oh, um, am I not seeing it? Oh. Sorry, now I've, I've just, uh, oh, I've, I also couldn't hear. Oh, no, there are lots of people that couldn't hear the films. Um, oh, I'm so sorry about that. Um, we, we did trial this yesterday. I think if you, if you might want, if, if you could provide us with the links to the, the films, if they're on, uh, on the internet, yes. um, we could so, forward those on. So Marketing. This will have been the presentation, which I presume will also be available uh, .net forward slash barra. So mapping the c.net forward slash barra um, that I've just oh, sent to all. And the link that I've put there is uh, a link to the actual uh, interactive online map of the sea. Um, so the kinetic typography and the altar stone story that, that, that I showed is, is available there. Um, and in relation to the film, um, I will um, have a look for the, the, the Vimeo link, um, and I will add that in to the, uh, the presentation before I send it to Emma. Um, so yes, links uh, from Sue. Yes, I've just sent that link, so I can send more links. Um, this is a comment. So from Claire, again, a comment rather than a question. At the last mass annual science meeting, there was an interesting talk on how communications between scientists and government work with local people in the wake of Fukushima nuclear disaster, basically local people trusted information from people who were local to whom they could relate easily. Yeah, this reflects your experience. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's why it is extremely progressive on the part of Marine Scotland that they actually agreed to fund natural, voluntary action, Barra and Battersea, to carry out um, this facilitation process. And very interestingly, what it does is it also puts local people in terms of voluntary action, Barra and Battersea, in the position that people in uh, the policy environment or outside consultants would normally be in, 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 in trying to deal with, with, with the different interests within their own community and, with, and within the other communities. Uh, so yeah, are you can do it so. Some parts of the film are difficult to hear, but will depend on bandwidth. Okay, so what might be easiest then if I just send the file uh, Emma. Oh, so there was a problem with that as well. Reef, the others are a bit slow. Yeah, uh, well, I was just going to say, Ruth, we, we've actually recorded this webinar, so if you could um, just email me through the links uh, to the yeah. videos uh, afterwards, we can we can post those on the MAST's website along with the uh, the uh, video uh, of your presentation. Um, so everyone yeah. can just uh, log, uh, well, just head to the MAST's website, and uh, in a few days' time, you should be able to view those videos. Okay, that's great. Okay, uh, well, I don't think uh, if like, oh, hang on, I think we've got another comment and question from Jean Luc. Oh, there were there repercussions for local people who were perceived to have stepped into the policy realm, where they seen as turncoats, or were they so re respected locally that they could do so with impunity? Yeah, I was. Uh, I, I um. I was referring to this during the presentation, but perhaps not clearly enough. 
um, there were definitely repercussions and are still repercussions for the key local people who have stepped into the policy realm. Um, there is, um, in 2008, there was a group set up in Barra called Southern Hebrides Against Marine Environmental Designations Shamed, who have been very vociferous. And while they have been involved in negotiations with the policy context, it's kind of been on an on-off basis in that they will engage and then they might release something with rhetoric which is kind of quite defensive and reflective of the old position. So definitely those people who are engaging consistently, constructively with the policy environment have been perceived um, as betraying the cause by not everyone within the community but by certain members of the community who are still wedded to their old position. So that's why I was making the point that um, in, in, in both cases, both within the policy environment and within BARA, key people there have stepped into quite vulnerable positions where they are taking risks in wanting to kind of change the dynamics uh, to allow new possibilities uh, to open up. Um, in terms of whether people on BARA uh, involved in dialogue were so well respected locally that they could do this with impunity, um, and many of them are very well respected locally um, and therefore this does offer them some protection um, uh, and respect uh, from people, uh, but not from all, as I said. But yeah, very good question. Uh, well, I think I, I don't think anybody else has any, any questions, uh, so I think we might leave it there, uh, Ruth. Yeah, I think... Okay. Yeah, we, I think we've had a few comments come through thanking you for, for your webinar. It was very interesting. Um, yeah, and yeah, as I as I mentioned uh, earlier, everyone, the, the video of the uh, Ruth's presentation will be available on the Maths website uh, probably mid-week next week. Uh, okay, so uh, thanks, Ruth, and uh, hopefully be in touch uh, shortly by email. Okay, thanks very much. Goodbye. Bye.